when we are doing the will of our true self, we are inevitably doing the will of the universe. In magic, these are seen as indistinguishable, that every human soul is in fact one human soul. It is the soul of the universe itself, and as long as you are doing the will of the universe, then it is impossible to do anything wrong. Hey, um, hi. Uh, I just wanted to give a short introduction to the chat with Michelle. Sorry for the, I don't know, the the absence, I suppose. Um, we're about to embark on a pretty wonderful road trip, I guess, to clear our heads and whatnot. And I uh, just wanted to say what a wonderful chat it was with Michelle. And, you know, she, I don't know if she revealed some things, but she revealed some things to me that I, I find absolutely enthralling and and brilliant and beautiful. And I hope you all will agree. Um, in any case, I <laughs> should be back in full form soon, uh, obviously. I think our community, I think humanity as a whole has been going through some really heavy, heavy shit. And um, it's gotten personal. And, you know, there's a lot of people affected pretty deeply by health things. So I just want to say, uh, love you, Sam. Love you, Lord Josh. Uh, love you, Jonicide. Love you, uh, Sarah and Robin and Maggie and everyone that's tumbling and, uh, you know, uh, facing the brutal heavy of somatic life. And yeah, that's all I wanted to say. Anyways, thank you for tuning in and please, I don't know, hug somebody for the fucking love of God. Hug somebody. All right. Honto. I am Keith Ross. This is Prag Magic. Uh, not to give a lot of preamble because there is so much that Michelle does and is so wonderful at musician, podcaster, tarot diviner, uh, spellcaster, you name it. So, uh, ladies and gentlemen, Michelle Embry. Hi. <laughs> Yay. Thank you, Keith. Thanks for having me here today. This of is so cool. cool. Yeah, I was so excited to talk to you. I know that we had a wonderful chat a week or so ago and we've kind of been, you know, our, our community has been blistering and bubbling with a lot of stuff recently. And yeah. it's so good to like find like-minded people to continuously keep up to date with and check in with. And yeah. So how have you been? I've been actually really pretty good. Uh, I have so many like projects. So like the pandemic times and like all that kind of times I have like, I have lots to do. So I've actually been pretty good, mostly focusing on Secret Antenna, which is the podcast that I do with Callie Tinsel. Um, so that's, that's been one of my main focuses lately, actually. Yeah. And you also, you write a tarot column. Um, I know you do some, what would you consider it counseling or is it like, yeah, I do. I do a, um, I do a tarot column with anti-gravity magazine, which is comes out of new Orleans. It's such a great, it's such a great paper. You can, and you can get it online and you can, you can order it in the mail and all that stuff. And I've admired that paper for a long time. And so like, actually this month is makes one year that I've been writing a monthly a uh, collective tarot reading for the city of New Orleans, which is just like, ah, yeah, that's just, awesome. It's so awesome. I feel I'm just grateful every month when I get to do that. So that is definitely one thing that I am really proud of and love to do. Um, and then, yeah, I have my private practice, which is, yeah, it's interesting that you asked that because it's like tarot card reading. Yes, it is. It definitely is that I definitely bring in my cards and I'm definitely reading your cards. 
but it's also mostly what I work with people about certainly is, um, yeah, it's more, it's a lot more like counseling and I want my, I want my work to be that that is the space that I want to be in with people. Like I'm really not trying to predict what's going to happen to you like that. That's okay. That's entertainment. That's fun. Like if you go to a carnival or a psychic fair or something like that's good times to see if somebody can predict something that's fun, but uh, that's not really what I do on a daily basis with people. I was going to say, yeah, because and we talked deeply about this the other night because I have a firm want of some sort of service within this. And like, you know, counseling is something I think about a lot, not because I think that, you know, I'm an authority or somebody should, you know, uh, take my image or what I do as like part and parcel what they should do. But I feel that there is something I feel like I can... Uh, you know, I know the advice I should be taking and because of the experiences that I've had in my life that, you know, it's, it's nominal for somebody that's going through a lot of the rough and tumble of life to, you know, hear from people that have had that experiential process, you know? And when, when did you start thinking that, yeah, like I can, I can help people. I could be of service in this. Um, yeah, that's a really good question. Um, I first went professional with tarot cards in 2012. So it's actually been about eight years now, um, which is kind of a while. And when I first really went into doing it, it was just kind of like, I was in a space where like I had, um, I had money to live on for a while and I wanted to do writing and stuff. And I thought, Oh, I love tarot cards. I'll just see, I'll just hang my shingle out. You know, I didn't really need to like, you know, I'll just see what yeah. happened. You know? And, um, and I started reading for people at that point in time. And it was, uh, you know, I didn't have a lot of clients and I was pretty cheap and, you know, and all of that. But as people came to me, I was like, oh, wait, there's really actually a lot I can do with this. And by 2014, I was like, you know, I want to make tarot cards and spiritual counseling and that type of work pretty much my main focus, my full-time gig. And, you know, like, like I said, at the, at the, at that point in time, like I had, I had this little stack of money that I planned to use basically to not work. Like that was right. the plan for the money. Right. And so like, it wasn't going to last forever. <laughs> you know, right. But it was, it was what I wanted to do with the money. And I never look back and regret it. Like, you know, that's a great, if you can, if you can afford it, taking a few years off is a really good idea. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, this would right. have been the year for sure. Yeah. <laughs> this would have been the year. Yeah, for sure. So, but by the time that like, I needed to like, actually like work again, um, and make an income again, I was like, this is what I want my life to be. And I had realized at that point in time, like, this is not about me predicting your future. This is not really about entertainment. Like we need to talk about spirit. We need to talk about wounds. We need to talk about, you know, yeah, trauma. trauma. Yeah. Yeah. And realizing how much as someone who deals with a lot of trauma from my past, I didn't at first see myself as the most capable person for that. I, mm -hmm. I don't know why now looking back on that, that doesn't make a lot of sense to me. But at the time back then I was like, well, you need somebody who like doesn't have those problems to help you. And now <laughs> I'm like, what? No, you know, it's, yeah. it's really the opposite. And I find so often with clients, you know, what I do with them is when they're talking about their own state of mind and how they approach the world and these different things with them, I'm like, you know, I'm like you and here's the way, here's what happens to me and here's how I help myself. And that that's really helpful to people in one way. The other thing I sometimes can do with people is I'm like, you know, we're just going to sit in the place together where this really hurts. And we're just yeah. going to breathe together and we're just going to be in this pain together for a second because like, why should you be alone? Um, something else that I was doing like during this period of time when I wasn't working was I was touring. I learned that I could do, I could perform uh, with my voice in a way that was really helpful to people. So between 2011 and two, or between, yeah, 2011 and 2013, I toured this kind of hellaciously dark 
show that I did about my, it was my memoir, it was my story. And, uh, and it was interesting when I first started doing it that, uh, I don't know, my poor first audience, like I had no idea that what I was saying was so dark. Like right. I was so right. <laughs> Your own life. You're like, you know how it is, you know, enter any like horrifying trauma, you know, and you're like, you know how they do you. You know, and when yeah, other yeah. people are like, ah, um, it taught me something. So I feel like I almost killed my first audience, right? Anyway, the point is of this is that that story started to evolve. And I realized that um, rather than me just reading my memoirs, that I could do a type of performance. And that's when I first brought in a musician to work with me. So mm. I started setting this stuff to like beats. And so that even though I was giving people this really dark story, I was also bringing all of this healing work to it. And one of the things that I said, it was a story called uh, By the Skin of These Words. And it was my own, it was my own life story. And kind of saying like, I really just survived psychologically and maybe even physically because I found a way to put this, these words, I found a way to use words, like was what it comes down to, but you could use anything. You could use paint, you could use music, you could use yoga. I don't, you know, like, but I, my way was words. So one of the things that I had said during that performance was, you know, for those of you who have like been in these situations, especially as children, like crimes were committed and the people got away, away, you know, and like nothing, no justice will ever be had. But these things, they weren't, it wasn't a childhood. It was a crime. It was a crime right. scene. Right. Yeah. And that one of the most powerful things I had felt that I'd said in that story when I was presenting these to audiences was I was like, you know, but the thing is, is like, I'm your witness. I know exactly what happened to you. You know, crimes were committed, lies were told, no justice will be found. I am your witness, you know, and this is my testimony on your behalf. Like I saw the whole thing. And that's like a line from one of the show, from the show is I saw the whole thing. And when I would say that, the audience would just be like, <gasps> and have this moment. And at that time I was like, you know what? I'm not making that up. I do know what happened to you. I did see the whole thing. I am your witness, even if you were alone. So why would we be alone there ever again? Yeah. And right. And so in realizing that, that from that show, that's what I started to really put into my tarot work is like, why would we be there alone? I know what, I know what you went through. I know what it felt like. I know exactly who you are and where you were in that regard. So I don't want you to be there alone. I don't want to be there alone we can not be alone in that anymore. And so that's so much of what I bring to tarot. Yeah, I love that. And it's too, you know, we were talking about you know, when people seek a reader, when someone sings to them with how they read the cards or, you know, the, uh, the, the narratives kind of that they spin, like it has to come from somewhat of an experiential place. It has to, you have to share that tether, you know, of vulnerability in doing yeah. it, you know, cause you can go through the academic, realms of what tarot is and how to read you know uh yeah. just just in like an encyclopedic kind of idea of it but that's not what people seek you know when they when they're looking for someone to uh you know confer with yeah no it's it's really really true the more of myself i put into it the better off um the, the better the readings really go i mean that's definitely one of the things that i say to my clients is it's like you know if we didn't have something in common, you would have chosen another reader. Right. Like you're here today because I'm going to hear something I need to hear and it's going to come out of my own mouth. Right. You know? <laughs> and so like one thing I've definitely learned is like waking up and like, you know, I'll have my readings scheduled, you know, two or three readings I'm going to do that day. And I might wake up like, oh God, it's so much work, you know, mm -hmm. like kind of like that and in my own mood and having my own things go on. But what I know for sure by now is Michelle, you do that first reading and I come out and I'm like, woohoo! Like, and it doesn't matter what we talk about. And I say that too, I'm like, you can tell me, you're gonna leave things here and you can tell me all of these things. Like we can be in all of these dark places, but none of that's gonna stick with me. I'm really just a vessel right now. And like, we're both getting healing through this. So we can have a really hard conversation. We can talk about, you know, suicide. We can talk about getting beat up. We can talk about, we can talk about really dark things. I'm saying you know, when I get off this phone, I'm going to be like, yeah. Right. <laughs> you know, right. Yeah. There's a vexation. Yeah. It's like, yeah. yeah. And it's such a, you know, the vulnerability has been like such a prime 
uh, lesson, I guess I should say, but in hopes of it being a superpower eventually, you know, because I think a lot of in, the, in this realm of, you know, kind of a cult Nick, you know, um, uh, procedures and practices and stuff. There's the people that move kind of to the top of the echelon somehow are the ones that kind of decree some sort of enlightenment or, you know, uh, put themselves off as some elevated, you know, person that they've, you know, conquered all the transgressions that, you know, us, you know, peons go through or whatever. You know? And right. it's like, no, it's, I don't see how it's ever, it never ends. Yeah. You know? Right. Yeah. It never ends. And then too, I don't know. I mean, just like, if you really look into like gurus, right. Like what's really in their life is nothing like what they're portraying i mean like right. sometimes it's like stuff that you're like god regular people would never do that crap like yeah. you literally are like you know so i don't trust that stuff a lot it, yeah at it's, all. Like, it's like yeah well, i always say what do they do at thursday at 3 p.m you know yeah that's yep, that's, who that's they are. right <laughs> yeah that's who they are but yeah, you, you know and this yeah this ties it back to just was that performance that you did that you said you know you killed your audience was that kind of like a liminal ceremony like it was one of those it was almost a, a public grieving yes yeah. yes and it, at first i didn't get it like in 2011 it was just as i was a zine writer back in the day i did you know i was a zine writer and i, I had written a novel also that was published by soft skull and oh, nice. i was kind of like, yeah and you know so i was in the like they called it like the punk lit underground you know uh -huh. at the time. And so um, that's what I was used to, was being a zinester and being a novelist. And so I went and I was just reading my work, right? And at that time, no, seriously, that first audience, I looked up and the looks on their faces, I'm like, okay, I can draw some of this, like, telling trying to talk to people about trauma doesn't mean i have to tell them all every single horrifying gory detail right as but, much as you want to <laughs> right well i think right i think one of the main lessons one of the main healing and that first audience forgave me because i was like i am so sorry there are some parts of that story i will never tell again you yeah. know but, but it wasn't i was doing it because there was this part of me that one didn't realize how bad it was and two, didn't expect to be heard because I'd been saying it so many times in different ways over the course of my life and nobody heard it, you know, right? It went over right. Head, right. But once I took up the microphone and I had, I had it written on paper and I had a, a flyer to tell you to come see me, it suddenly became something that everyone took seriously. And I didn't need to tell you the worst of it. I could allude to it and you would understand. Yeah. And so right and in the beginning i really didn't those were the two things i didn't know like oh that didn't happen to you when you were a kid and two, like right. like oh i can not tell you the gory details exactly and you can still surmise what happened to me so that was one thing and then when it turned to this more performative and i brought in a musician and i broke those stories down so that they were more poetic and i started to really feel like what you call audio nancy right mm -hmm. like i started to feel that i could do this work on people with my voice and i hadn't known that i could do that before and at that point in time yes it became the ceremony of grieving and another thing that i would say at the end of the performance is i would say you know and now I, I can't remember the exact words but it was i would say you know a murder of crows comes in and picks up the four corners of this room and carries all of this grief away right and so you know and then we would have this kind of you know impromptu ceremonial yes grieving with this idea that these birds come in and they take it all up off the floor and they take it away with them and um and i would include that as part of the work that i did with that particular performance so like yeah publicizing it kind of being loud and not like loud in, in annoyance ways but like you know having the self speak volumes, you know, through performance um, and stuff, do you find there's accountability in that, that you, you know, once you put out those flyers, like you had to show up if you didn't want to, you know, be a part or couldn't, you know, handle the vulnerability or the grieving of that day, like too bad, yeah. you know, like, <laughs> you had to show up and be accountable. No, yeah. that was true for sure. And especially like when we toured it and people would ask, you know, like, how do you like do this every day, you know? And like, 
you know, basically the answer was like, well, talent, you know, but, um, (laughs) (laughs) um, but we were on a mission though, too, you know, at the time we were on a mission, we were just the musician I was working with at the time, you know, we were just like, no, this is what we're, this is the medicine that we're bringing to the people. And this is what we're going to do. And so we did manage it. Yeah. But yeah, you got to show up whether you're like, oh God, I want to, Today, I don't feel like telling my trauma story. Well, too bad. You're on tour with it. And I did tour other things later that didn't, that didn't, they were, they're um, fictional stories. It's a trilogy I did called the Crush Kids Stories. And those were three different performances um, that are not that. Um, You know, they're fictional, they're fictional stories, um, you know, but that are also medicine. They're also very much about healing people. Yeah. Yeah. You're just, you're just speaking through kind of a folkloric lens. Yeah. yeah yes yes that's do it you, exactly do, do you think that's more used to to kind of have a universal voice do you find that like maybe fiction helps you know the the tether between more people or is it or is it through personal like story hmm. yeah no that's a really good question i think it takes both really like mm-hmm. i think it's both i think there are some people who responded more to the to the um memoir work that i did and then I think that there's people who responded um, more to the fictional work that I did. Um, yeah, that's a good question. I mean, I think it, t- I think it takes both, you know, yeah. in, in a big way. But I love the, like, folkloric, like, aspect, the mythical way to, like, he- it's really healing for people also when you have this, like, universalizing vulnerability, universalizing right. this vulnerability in a way and showing the possibilities of that vulnerability. Now, you know, 2020, it seems like there is a universal grieving or, you know, vulnerability through like your tarot work, like your monthly column. Have you kind of unearthed things like just collectively? Uh, Yeah, I mean, I guess a little bit doing the monthly column is funny for me because they're I mean, they're there is a predictive quality to tarot, right. even if it's just like, I want to strip it out sometimes and be like, well, <laughs> that's not really the most important thing. Um, I know my editor for the, for the paper down there, you know, he was really um, taken by the column I had written for the month of May, which had been written mid April. And if you really look at it, it predicts the George Floyd's. Oh, really? Yeah. And like, yeah, that's kind of what I said when he pointed it out later. Like, he's like, you know, actually, if you realize this was written in mid-April, this is kind of stunning. And I was like, what is he talking about? And then I was like, oh my God. I was like, right at, I, you know, I was close to like predicting the George Floyd murder to a certain, you know, degree. Uh, Mm -hmm. But what I said in that column really related to it. And it's funny because the only thing, like, I always try to find something that's like, um, it's uplifting right and that month when i had written that the uplifting part felt really not quite right but mm-hmm. i still kind of felt like i should put it in there and it's the only part of it that i'm like i if i had it to do again i wouldn't do that and now oh, really? i'm yes because it was the anytime i feel a little bit like oh you're stretching to make things nicer than they are <laughs> fires on me you know it didn't fully backfire in that column but honestly there's like two sentences in that column that would have made that particular column even more truthful than it was you know so and like yeah so um so in doing that column no i've actually it's funny because i've actually like learned more about the predictive aspects of my ability than i had before like it's not that i don't know that that's there because people will come back to me and they're like everything you said was going to happen happened and i'm like that's interesting <laughs> you know like yeah. it always feels interesting you know but the columns taught me a lot about that so for you is you know are like the somewhat preternatural or divinatory aspects are you are you because i know you're also a practitioner you you do a lot of like even spell casting online and and stuff have you um what 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 have you surmised over time like are you are you dipping into something you know, preternatural and collective, like an unconscious, or is it more like, you know, are you tuning to your, to your own subconscious, you know, like what have you been finding has been the more, you know, the biggest reprieve of all of it or resolve, yeah. I should say. Mm, it's a good question. Cause like out of all of it, you know, like 
it's interesting like my background my upbringing uh, my mother was like she was like this um she swore up and down she was an atheist but she wasn't really because she'd have like these like ruth montgomery books i don't know if you know that author sure. but like yeah. yeah okay she had these ruth montgomery books around and one time i remember i came home and her and her friend were in the dark trying to find their auras and i was like oh my god <laughs> um <laughs> but she would swear up and down that she was an atheist and as a kid like i couldn't use the word god in the house mm. right so um it's just she had been abused by religion you know yeah. and she was just like we're not doing that here you know and i don't believe in this stuff and i think it ruins it ruins individuals and it ruins society and like these people are crazy you know they're crazy and i you know i don't disagree with her but my but she wasn't entirely um really atheist either obviously she believes in something right um so but having been raised like that uh even then kind of getting into tarot cards and even like you know some other like spiritual works that i get into um i did not expect to feel as connected to something that maybe i would consider i don't know an ultimate consciousness mm -hmm. um a collective consciousness i mean a singular consciousness even there's a way in which i feel like i plug in to this kind of you yeah, know fabric I, yeah yeah Something. that is kind of yeah. everything like if mm -hmm. i could fully like the human brain couldn't fully take in like full consciousness without just like exploding like we just right don't. yeah we can't it's, it's the we can't. yeah that's why we need the metatron you know because we can't fathom the voice of god or whatever <laughs> i guess yes no that's exactly right no it's exactly right we can't know all of these things you know but there is um there is this way in which I feel like I plug in. I mean, yeah. So like, I'm trying, I want to answer your question pretty specifically. It, it's a pretty hard one. Yeah. It's a pretty hard one, but like and through this work and especially, like I said, coming from this background where religion, like I feel like so many people that I meet that are new age, they've, so to speak, and I don't want to go off on anyone, but I figure, I feel like this is something I need I'll come up against a lot of times. Your kind of new age spirituality would fit really well, right directly back into Christianity. Like you've really just right. changed words and I'm not going off on anyone. It's understandable that that mm -hmm. would happen, you know, yeah. right? Um, absolutely. And just dogma, it's hard to break dogma. And even when it hurts you and you're like, I've been hurt by the church, so I don't like those words but then somehow you wind up with a new age kind of perspective that really is just Christianity with a, with a different set of words, mm -hmm. and which again is okay. Um, you know, I, again, I just don't want to go off on anyone, you know, whatever, but I certainly have a critique of that. Um, so wait, where was I going with this? So, I wanted, oh, so I guess I'm surprised for myself how much I really do feel like there is maybe some kind of collective consciousness and how much I feel like does come through me from this, from, from, I don't know, I don't even want to say a higher place, but just a different place. I feel like I can, I feel like I can log into something. I think that, I think the internet's a really good metaphor for spirituality in a lot sure. of ways. Yeah. yeah so i feel like i can really like log into this thing and then i have something that maybe i generically call guides i mean when i'm working i have my cards in front of me and i'm reading my cards i have on my right side a lot of people when i'm teaching intuition and in classes and things like that and they say well like how do you know i'm like you know over time it just got for me that like my guides generically speaking come in on my right side and then you get mm. me over here who's sometimes arguing with them i'm like are you kidding and you yeah. know and they're like right but i know who's who just because i've done this long enough you know um so i do feel like whatever is over here on my right which really just comes in it's kind of like these like orbs that either like nod or shake their head or maybe point to a story that's already in my own brain like tell this person this story and sometimes i'll be like you want me to tell them what and i'll be like okay they want me to tell you the story and then the person will go oh and i'm like all right i don't know what that meant to you but it, but it meant something you know mm -hmm. there's so many times i leave a reading and i'm like i don't know those were the things i was supposed to say to you and they mean something to people that i know i'll never understand yeah i struggle with it too you know i've uh i spoke with sayroth about this a bunch where i'm kind of in this you know that liminal kind of gray or agnostic static of you know is it just uh 
my subconscious that I'm tuning or is there actually something outside and it switches all the time, you know? Um, But I think, you know, people tune into this stuff and they look for it. It's a lot of times it's through desperation. Like it's through adversity and, you know, given the state of the world now, it's no wonder that people are tuning more to, you know, the like occult practices and, and tarot and astrology just to try to calibrate some answers or seek outside. But you're right. People take it and it's, it's just a different terminology. They just interchange. That's basically mm-hmm. you're just a faith-based idea. Yeah, which yeah. apparently like as human beings we need no matter what. Like we apparently, you know, I'm not saying every person, but like, like it's a, it's a really standard, like human need to have a belief that our lives have meaning. I think it's really difficult for people to like move forward when the the idea that like, this is it, this is your one shot. And if your life is difficult, um, to whatever degree you are just like, I don't know if it doesn't have any meaning at all. I'm not sure how to move forward. And so sometimes, you know, people just invest, you know, in that, which is fine. Um, right. right. But I do, I mean, I have really come to the point where I'm like, I mean, God, do individual lives have meaning? That one's rough, but like, <laughs> like there's, <laughs> but there is something, um, but there is something bigger than us for whatever. I don't know. I'm going to throw this in there because this is really interesting for me being raised as somebody, um, who was, you know, don't say God in the house, you know, like, don't like, you know, religion is not this way to go or whatever with things. Um, I actually did come to in my twenties, um, to having pretty much a pretty big like relationship with what I would call God, which was really funny because I had an atheist mother and then I was a punk, like punks don't do that. You know, they're atheists too, you know, right. Mm -hmm. So it's just like, I spent like probably, you know, most of my twenties into half of my thirties, at least hiding it that I like had that I believed in God right Mm -hmm. and so uh, and then I like came out with it and it wasn't like my mom still didn't like it my friends didn't like it and I'm like god god Uh, yeah (laughs) so what so so that's like you know gosh you know over but it was just it was like your idea of the absolute right or like yeah like you were saying it it had no you didn't mean a Christian God or a, a nomination at all right Right. right. But I also didn't feel the need to use a different word, you know, because sometimes people are like, oh, source. And I'm like, well, we're still, that's fine, right. but we're still talking about God. You know, <laughs> exactly. the universe, that's fine, but we're still talking about God, you know. So I didn't find a need to use a different word for it. What is interesting for me is this past year, because I feel like, you know, you get to a certain place with your spirituality and you're like, okay that's where I'm at. That's who I am. Like, that's my spirituality. I got a handle on it. I'm just going to move ahead. This is sometimes why I feel like people choose religion anyway. And they're like, well, guess what? I don't have to think about anymore. Like, right. My religion just kind of explains to me how to practice. I don't have to think about it anymore. Right. Um, And I can appreciate that even more than ever, like this year, because something that just happened um, after all of the, I mean, literally just a few months ago, uh, back maybe, uh, maybe February, March, something like that. I just woke up and I had this realization that like, cause I was praying all these years I've been praying. I would just pray to God. It just made sense to me. I was comfortable with it. <laughs> Even <laughs> like my mom and my friends are like, Oh my God. Um, you know, I would still made sense to me and I would pray to God. Right. So this year that changed because I woke up one day and I had this realization that, um, or whatever, my, whatever you want to call it, realization might not be the right word, but there was a shift in my spirituality and having this realization for me that what I was calling God actually had no, um, was a completely neutral force. It's a completely neutral creative force. Personality less. Yes. And doesn't, and doesn't have this, like, God is not, God is a creator. Sure. Like spitting things out of a black hole, basically Mm -hmm. like, I don't know, there's that, there's that. And it doesn't have this, like, I want things to be good. I'm not, I mean, like to say that God is creating from all love. I'm like, well, not really. I mean, God is just like creating whatever God can create kind of without personality, without determination, without any of the, without having a desire for how that thing will go or even Mm. really thinking about it, so to speak. Right. 
this is like new stuff for me and this created only a mild crisis because i've had so many spiritual crises at this point in time i'm like i'm like tell me something i don't know okay yeah <laughs> bring it on yeah. yeah, I think I'll just, you know, drink Diet Pepsi and eat candy in bed for a few days. So. <laughs> I know that goes. Yeah, yeah. yeah right. <laughs> um, so I wouldn't say it was a crisis, but at night when I go to sleep, I'd be like, dear black hole? No, that's not working for me, especially since you don't give a shit. So, um, so I went through that for a few months, but then I'm like, you know, but then like I got a little bit closer to like what I would consider my guides. You know, I hadn't had a direct conversation with them for a while. You start to take it for granted, especially for me. I'm seeing them all the time working with other people. So I had kind of stopped talking to my guides. I mean this really generically. Sure. Um, I had stopped talking to my guides, you know, personally like for a long time. And so I started talking to them personally again and they were, they uh, agreed that this was like, yeah, no, you're right. The source of all things is neutral that doesn't mean that we don't have plans. And, you know, it made me think about the concept of Jesus, you know, which is a big concept for me, which is, and there's a reason that that's so, which we could talk about if you wanted to, but, mm -hmm. and, but at any rate, like the guides and the things were like, that doesn't mean that we're not real and don't have desires just because God creates indiscriminately doesn't mean we're indiscriminate or that we're meaningless. Well, I'm getting chills right now. They're yeah. Like, like le lesser gods, like, like the lesser gods what a great yeah. way to put it and i'm like and then it makes sense as to why i feel like we need to like onboard so to speak with these you know yeah lesser gods i love that to onboard with like these forces that do have desires for us that are really really quite beautiful and have desires for themselves that are really really quite beautiful and are made of love right? Mm -hmm. Just because God is neutral doesn't mean that love doesn't come out of it. And this is all, this is new stuff for me, Pete. This is new territory for me. We would have had this conversation a year ago and I'd say, no, I'm a, I believe in God. And like, I believe God created all things, you know, and, and God is love. Like I, we would have had that conversation, but now I'm like, nope, God's a black hole. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I mean, I love it. It's, and it's, it's not, there's, you know, there's something I find, I don't know, just I, romantic is the first word that comes to mind talking about a black hole which is really funny but uh, <laughs> right. you know but like there's something i don't know there's just a relief or like a resolve like of just the the gentle understanding that you know this is a personalityless god he did not he is not a he it is yeah. you know there was no we are not the end all be all the human species you know god does not look like us is not doesn't have our petty wants, wants and qualms, you know, and, mm -hmm. uh, but there is, yeah. And then there's that challenging aspect, but there is perhaps, you know, just, there's just levels. There's like a, I, I'd hate to use the term hierarchy because fuck hierarchy, but, <laughs> but you know what I mean? There's, you, there's some sort of structure about um, maybe the things that preternaturally that we, we deal with and experience during, you know, these practices and stuff that isn't, Every, if everything's about the source, everything's about the absolute, you know, there's still things we have to weave and, you know, have relationships with, you know, below that. Yeah. In a way. Oh, absolutely. And especially with our limited little human mm -hmm. capacity here. Yeah. For Did sure. you, when you were tuning, like your guides, was it just through continual practice of, you know, reading tarot and kind of tuning in that way or did you use other kind of methods to help you commune with them okay well <laughs> <laughs> i had this experience so i um in 2008 from the time i was like 17 until i was 35 i was a really really heavy drinker i was mm -hmm. a blackout drunk and um in the beginning of 2008 january of 2008 I quit. And um, I did this with like, I needed, I, I took Camperol, which is like a cessation drug. Like it was, I oh, mean, yeah. it was, yeah, like this was not, this was very serious business. Like right. I had not been an adult person who was not a blackout drunk, like straight up. And um, I couldn't really, I couldn't quit without help and I couldn't sleep. And like, this is serious business, right? This isn't just mm -hmm. like somebody who's like, oh, 
you know, having those couple glasses of wine is really right. taking it out of me now. Harm reduction. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> right. No, this is right. This was serious business. And I was someone who'd like, I'd been through DTs before, you know, and mm -hmm. like, like I, it was serious business. Right. So anyway, that's January of 2008. I'm going to quit. And so I decide that like, like I have no idea how to like live. I, I don't know. And like, and I can't sleep and all these things are going on. And I was a writer. I'd already published a novel by then, but I'd always wanted to get my master's degree. And so I decided I would go back to school and get my master's degree. And I fell in love with um, Goddard College up in Vermont, which is a low residency program. And so I decided that I was going to apply there. And if I didn't get in, I'd apply the next year. That's where I wanted to go. Right. Mm -hmm. So I send in my application. So this is, um, and then June of that year, I'm in, I'm going, I'm going back. I'm going to get my master's degree. One of the things I'd wanted to do my whole life. So I'm like, right. great. And this is still like, I still can't sleep at night. I'm still totally unsure as to whether or not I can um, not drink. Like, you know, this, and then like the cessation drugs started making me dizzy so I couldn't even drive to work. I'm like, well, right. that's not going to work, you know? Like, and that's the drug that like you get physically ill if, it, if you imbibe? No, it's no? the opposite. She told me, I'd asked my doctor, I'd said, do you know about something called Camperol? And she, mm -hmm. she was a good doctor. I was lucky to have her at the time. She's like, I haven't heard of it, but I'll look it up. And if I can get it for you, I will. If not, I'll give you an abuse, which is what mm. you're talking about. And I said, I said, that won't work. Yeah. I said, punishing me does not work. Yeah, you know what I made point. a joke? I said, ask my father, you know, like, yeah. I really, like <laughs> right. I didn't, you know, like punishing me does not work. Like I'll, cause like, here's the deal with an abuse. Like once you get violently ill and throw up, then you can get drunk. Oh, Wow. Yeah. Yeah. So <laughs> I know that from people in the military. So anyway, I had, so camp roll, no, actually what camp roll does or what they hope that it does is it's targets because like your when you drink that much, your brain receptors like close down. So you go into extraordinary depression because you're like serotonin receptors are literally closed down. So mm -hmm. they had hoped they weren't sure, but they felt like camp roll could target that and help your receptors open. Right. I don't know if it did that, but psychologically, these taking these big horse pills like worked for me until they started making me dizzy, and I actually had to call off a day from my job, and I was like, "Well, I'm I can't lose my job, you know." Yeah. So anyway, so I stopped taking those things, and I was really shaky, and I went to my first low residency gig up there in Vermont. You know, you go and you stay for a week, and you do full time work for the rest of the semester, but you send it in through the mail. And so, and I really, that isn't even why I took that program. I just really liked the, I was really attracted to the program. So anyway, here's the deal. So I get there and um, this man named Paul Selig is oh, giving- Oh, I know Paul Selig. Yeah. All right. The channeler? Yes. Yeah. Except that's not what he, ooh, I got to chill all over me. That's not what he did at the time. This is 2008. His books, his first, uh, I Am The Word didn't come out till 2010. It came oh, out- wow month I graduated. I know this. So anyway, he was my program director, right? I got chills all over me telling you a story. That's so crazy. It's crazy. So he gave this opening speech to us while we were there. And I was like, holy shit, just listening to him talk. I was like, who is this person? What is he saying? Like, what is he doing? This is so funny. This is such a funny story. I was really enamored of him. I was like, how is he like, you know, and one of the things he said is like, none of you are in this room by accident. And I was like, whoa, what is so wild about him saying that? Like, why do I feel so drawn? You know? So, okay. So I go, and he had this little dog at the time named Darla. And I think he has a different dog now, but he had a little dog named Darla, a little Yorkie mix. And it was so cute. And I love dogs, whatever. And he carried around, he had that dog with him everywhere. Only person I'd, I would see him in the cafeteria with her in a bag and he'd be at the salad bar and she'd be over that plexiglass going like this. And I'm like, the only <laughs> To get away with that Paul Selig, right. right? Anyway, I go up to his office because I really just want to meet him, right? And I walk into his office and I put my hand out to shake his hand and he holds up the dog. And I'm like, oh my God, this guy's a fucking weirdo, you know? And I was like, I just want to <laughs> say like, I thank you, you know, for having me in your program. I'm really happy to be here. And he's like, okay, thanks. You know, I walk away. I'm like, what a fucking weirdo, you know? <laughs> and it wasn't until later that I realized, like, he didn't want to shake my hand because he'd get all this information, right? Oh. I didn't know anything about this, right? Okay. I didn't know anything about this. So, okay, so here's one of the things that, it, that happens. During your first two residencies, you can't take any classes from Paul Selig, who's an amazing writing teacher and an amazing writer, okay? 
you can't take any of his workshops, writing workshops, until you're in your second year. And I was so fascinated by him, right? And so the only thing you could take in your first residency was his, it was called the Writer's Healing Circle. Now, mind you, we're at a time in my life where I see those words and I'm like, oh God, you know, right? Like, oh, this hippie, dippy, fuck, <laughs> bullshit. You know? And so like, but it got past, but I had to go because I was so right into mm -hmm. like, I had to go find out more about Paul Selig. So I go down to this thing that mind you keeps is beneath me. Okay. It's all beneath me, right? This writer's healing circle is so far beneath me. You can't even believe it. Right. But that having been said, I love how all the crappy parts of my personality come to make this moment for me. So, but that having been said, even though it was beneath me, I had to be better at it than anybody in the room. Right. right? Yeah. So, <laughs> so I get in there and I pull my dust. It's a carpeted room. You know, the desks are all whatever. I pull my desk up to the front. I sit down with my notebook and I'm ready to like take my hippy dippy. Like I am worth it. I am, you know, like whatever the, whatever the hell hippie <laughs> shit you're going to do, right? I'm going to do it better than anybody else in that room. And so um, then he comes in and he says, okay, everybody make a circle. And we make a circle. And I'm like, yeah, of course, we're hippies. We got to make a circle. So, but I'm up at the, the doors behind way, you know, like I'm up at the front of the room and I have to get through the room. I'd have to go through everybody to get out the door, right? This is an important aspect, right? Because that's my good student. I'm going to do better than everybody else, right? So anyway, he's like, listen, here's the, here's the truth about me. Um, here's where you are right now. You're in this room. I'm a channeler. And I was like, you're fucking kidding me. <laughs> right. And he's like, he's like, so like I channel these guides, you know, blah, blah, blah. He goes on about it. And he says, I recommend that every single one of you leave right now. And he says, especially since Mark Doty is next door. I don't know if you know who Mark Doty is. Um, but he's a writer. He was Particular, he wrote a really great book called Heaven's Coast that is about losing his boyfriend to AIDS, which is like, <gasps> if you ever, you need grief care, please read Heaven's Coast. It's amazing. Anyway, Mark Doty, he was, he's a famous writer, but at the time he was particularly popular. And so Paul Selig says, Mark Doty is next door doing a writing workshop. None of you will ever have the opportunity to do a writing workshop with Mark Doty ever again. I recommend all of you go next door and do that because I am a regular roadside attraction. Keats, I would have, except then the third part of my personality was I couldn't disrupt anyone to get out the door. Oh, yeah. Okay, so here's these three things about me that are coming together to keep me in that chair. All right, so Paul Selig starts channeling. <laughs> and we're all sitting in this circle and like literally i can feel a ring of fire go through our hearts because there were some people who wanted to sit on the floor and he's like i actually need you all at the same level and i'm like oh, god this shit's really getting deep huh you know but no i can feel it and the thing was i went into this incredible like trance space and where everything i was hearing like i couldn't have taken notes there was no way to do it and like i was like holy shit but it's okay because i'll never forget anything i'm hearing because this is the absolute 100% truth, all right? And so at the, it like, it was incredible. It was one of the most incredible experiences in my life. And so when it was over at this point in time, I don't think they do this anymore, but at this point in time, the guides, his guides would do regular, would do work on the individual people in the circle. And so he got to me, this is June of 2008. I quit drinking in January of, of 2008. So six months later, and I am not sure about myself i am still mm -hmm. really shaky i still can't sleep i still don't know how to live without drinking right yeah. and so we stand up and he gets to me you know and again like i didn't know what chakras were or anything but when they're they're like open your crown chakra i was like you must open your crown chakra better than anyone's ever opened their <laughs> crown chakra before, right and so like i'm trying really hard and they get to me and they're like they're like um they tell me, you know, like, tell her she's doing a good job. And he's like, they say you're doing a good job, you know, or whatever. And I was like, yeah, I really got the crown chakra open. Yeah, <laughs> hey, got an A plus on opening my crown chakra, whatever the fuck that is. I did it better than anybody else. Okay. And so like, you know, but then, and he gets irritated with the guides. He's so funny because he'll talk back to him. And he's like, and he's like, I just told her. And they were like, oh, they want me to tell you again that you're doing a good job. And he was so pissed off, you know? <laughs> and I was like, I was like, oh, they're not talking about my crown chakra. They're talking about drinking. Right. Right. 
And so I walked out of that room and I knew, you know, he was, I was going to be able to take those workshops more as over the next couple of years when I went to my residencies and that I would have one the following, I'd have another chance in January, but I'd have another one the following June. And I remember I walked out of that room and I was like, you know, it doesn't matter if you can come back to this chair in one year, even if you start drinking again, everything will be different. Nothing will ever be the same. All you have to do is make it back here without taking a drink for a year and your life has changed. And yeah. it was an absolute fact. And like, and so I, I did it, I made it back. But anyway, that's how I met Paul Selig. And that's how I met my guides, which I think are the same guides that Paul hmm. Selig told me. I think that they are, and they're, they're nodding their heads. Like I've been doing this with them for 10 years now, which is, yeah. kind of it's like legitimately like 10 years, like a couple of months ago. Um, 12 years, I guess that was 12 years ago. But, um, but anyway, I feel like I've been working with those guides for, so there's your answer to your question. There's my story about how it came into my life. And I was not at that point in my life, like this was not the kind of thing I was looking for. I actually like, I had pub 2008, my novel came out in 2006. And in 2008, I still wanted to be a novelist. Like my idea was still to be like, like a famous like literary writer. That's where I was going with this, not to sit in a room and like feel my soul filled by fucking channeling. You know, mm -hmm. like that's not <laughs> that's not who I was at the time. So So how did that reconfigure, you know, your trajectory moving forward? So you said you you know, you wanted to be a novelist and everything. So what what morphed? Like what became your new trajectory? Yeah, well I mean, I guess that's a slightly, I guess a little bit of what, because actually, like, actually, my novel came out, out in the fall of 2005, mm -hmm. which I had just been through Hurricane Katrina, because I was living in New Orleans. Right. And so that actually had changed my writing. I thought I would go back to writing novels, but at that point in time, I needed to write plays. And so I had written a play during that period of time which had a production that was like amazing i loved i loved that whole aspect of my life um so i was actually studying playwriting when i was there but i did think i would go back but also like playwriting novels can like you know you can veer off you can be like let's go have a picnic and talk about nothing right. you can do that in a novel in a play you can't every single word has to have a reason it's why action yeah yeah and like, and there's no, there's no extraneous words and there's certainly right. no extraneous like storylines. Like, why is that word there? If you cannot answer that question, you have to take the word out. Right. So that was part of why I wanted to study playwriting too. I just love the, um, I love the discipline of playwriting. I think playwriting is the, requires the most discipline out of any form of writing that there is. So that's part of why I really thought I'd go back to reading novels. Once I writing novels, once I used that, found that discipline in playwriting. Um, but I didn't. And what wound up happening then is I write these performances that I do with All a right. musician, right? Mm -hmm. That bring in these guys. So that's really how it changed me is that I really had no desire. What really changed is I had no desire to go back to the industry and to put, I'm working class, you know, yeah. putting yourself working class into the literary industry. Like, it's not that it can't be done. It's that it's that you have to take up really upper class values that I don't have. Mm -hmm. Like I don't have. I don't I care. Feel that. Money. Yeah. You know, like you make seven dollars an hour and you smoke cigarettes. I'm sorry, I don't have an opinion about that. And you, I mean, you know, hopefully mm -hmm. you get obviously like you don't put that in a novel, but in some ways you do. Like there is this way that literature makes the upper class. Um, feel like there's just nothing you could do. And, you know, as like a lifelong anarchist, I don't believe that either. I'm like, well, you could redistribute the wealth, but, you know, don't get me started. <laughs> so, um, so the way that it changed me then, the playwriting combined with the channeling and the tarot cards and all these different things came together. And it did, it put me on this different path in life to where I'm like, no, I want to use my capacity for language, um, for speaking, for public speaking, which I've done my whole life. My, and performance and my ability to write and my ability to tell a story I want to use and and tarot cards are all about speaking and telling stories too oh, I want to yeah. use all of those things to do really important like healing work on like on all of us including myself and to put something into the world that I think doesn't serve the upper classes so like <laughs> if I can nutshell all that into one place it's like it's actually true I've actually really just described myself pretty well I love that. Yeah, that sings to me. I feel like a lot of similarities. 
between Not us good. for that. Because yeah, I I definitely feel disjected by kind of the upper echelon things, you know, especially as a creative person or as a writer, yeah. as you know, kind of an ex academic in a way. You know, it's very very disgruntled, uh, especially from like an impoverished upbringing and uh-huh. you know. But mm-hmm. uh, yeah, there's something to be said. I think it's, I don't know. Uh, you know, I made that joke earlier about hierarchy sucking and uh, it kind of plays into this, you know? Yes. Yeah. yes it does. <laughs> no, yes, it does. I mean, like, I don't know. Again, you know, I'm not really trying to go off on anyone, but like the couple of people I know from working class backgrounds that are starting to be successful in the literature industry, they really throw their family under the bus, like caricatures, you know? Yeah. And I'm like, no can do, you know, like no can do. Like there's a lot of this stuff. I cannot make the upper classes feel better about keeping the rest of us poor. I don't have it in me. Yeah. I love that. I was going to ask, I think it'd be probably a good uh, ending kind of question, but uh, obviously you commune with these guides when you write, when you create. I do. Do you uh, have a way of kind of describing what that process is like? Um. Yeah. Ooh, see, I get chills on my knees. I read so much through my body and anytime nice. I start kind of around. Yeah. Um, I really, you know, like it'll just like when I go into my writing, like I have a pretty good writing discipline, which I think is important. You know, um, if nothing else, just I put up card, tarot cards every day, five days a week on social media, which keeps me accountable, not only to my like um, spiritual tarot practice, but also just every day I have to write it something at least Mm -hmm. a sentence you know like right um which i think is important but what if i look back through my notebooks are even places where i've typed into google docs you know just free typed um the notebooks my writing gets really big and really large and even in the google docs like things you know like the typos will get going and there's all kinds of weird strange word uses that i wouldn't use Mm -hmm. um there are definitely sometimes it's funny it's kind of like um it's like lucid dreaming a little bit if you suddenly go oh shit i'm dreaming you wake up Right. I mean, or, oh, yeah. or like, you're just like, oh, shit, I'm lucid dreaming. It, you like it wake up. kicks you out. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It kicks you out. Yeah. It's kind of similar. Like if I like, if I realize they're there, I'll be like, oh my God, they're here. And then I'm like, oh shit, shit yep. where'd you go? You know, Scared them so, away. yeah, you know, which is not them. It's me. Sure. Like right. now suddenly being in a state of mind that isn't accepting of like full reality and wants to recompartmentalize myself into what i'm used to so by saying which is true with lucid dreaming too because lucid i mean that's obviously just something you can do right Mm -hmm. but since we the moment you kind of say like no i'm not supposed to be able to do this it's like well fine and it's the same thing with the guides as soon as i'm like oh my god you're all here it's so crazy they're like it's like ah you just slam the door (laughs) (laughs) um so but they definitely do come through my process and in different ways and there are definitely times too when there are certain things in my writing or in my work whether i'm reading cards like there's certain things you know like that the cards are not gonna like like that my guides are not gonna come in on in a card reading you know if somebody's like really talking to me about like it's certain things that really just are going to require two human beings, like where it would be um, fraudulent for me to say, well, you know, my, the guides think you should, it's like, sometimes it's too serious. It's health and relationships in these ways that it's like, well, we don't do that. That's um, manipulative and silly. Mm-hmm. Um, so the same type of thing in my writing sometimes where I'm like, okay, guys, let's like do this thing. They're like, oh no, sorry. That's all you. You don't think we picked you for nothing, do you? We picked you because you know how to write. Like, right. Like you literally like you, st- like you're a master, you have a master's degree in writing. Like we chose you for that reason in part. Right. So because mm-hmm. not the degree, but just the, um, the ability. So they're like, at certain points in time, they're like, no, that's all you. Like we ha- we inspired it, but now you got to put the details together and turn it into a poem. That's all you. Yeah. <laughs> you got to do that work. So I think that's part of it too. I will say this, like when I, a part of what I teach with intuition with people also is like, you cannot intuit something you don't know. So knowledge is the way you want greater intuition create greater knowledge for yourself, whether it means reading science books or history books or teaching yourself how to code. It doesn't matter. They can find, the guides will find metaphors usable in anything that you know, but you have to know things. Like It's like trying to throw a dart at a dartboard that isn't there. Like All the guides can really do is throw darts at things that you know, so to speak. 
And so the more you know, the more they have to utilize. I hope right. that they have to they have to speak through the, your filter of self. Yeah. yeah. And if you yeah. don't have the skills or those those ideas, they can't they can't, they can't translate it. Yep. Um, exactly. I want, I think it's super synchronous. We're talking. Um, I think I've been pretty public about, you know, my, my drinking as of late. And it's, you know, it's, it's one of those gnawing annoyances. There's not, nothing been too dramatic or, or awful, but it's, you know, uh, I'll put it like this. Like I do my long kind of strenuous, you know, mental health stuff and everything. Um, I never utilized drugs or alcohol or anything to create or write. Mm -hmm. And it reminds me, it makes me think, excuse me, that, you know, it's because I was trying to make those channels more clear. You know, it's the drugs and the drinking in the past were for everything else. <laughs> right. 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 But, you know, I, yeah, I just, I really appreciate you telling that story. And, um, yeah, you know, we'll figure it out. We'll 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 all get through this together. Yes, we <laughs> yes we will. <laughs> Even if it takes a thousand years, we uh, will get through it together. <laughs> well, Michelle, thank you so much for speaking with me. Um, oh, thank you. It's been so fun. Yeah, this has been great. Obviously, you know, we'll keep talking, and I hope to have you on again. And yeah, I'll have this out this week. And uh, please plug, you have an amazing podcast with Callie that you're about to just do called The Secret Antenna. Mm -hmm. If you want to shout out all of your wonderful projects, please do. Oh, yeah, great. Um, Secret Antenna, you can find us on Anchor and Spotify, but probably the easiest way to find us is follow us on Twitter, where we put up, we'll put up our podcast, plus all our kind of supplemental materials. Um, we are doing a history of COINTELPRO. So if you don't know what that is, come find out. If you do know what it is, come be a gas, a gas, a gas with us on the subject. Um, that's one of my major projects. Um, uh, Anti-Gravity Magazine, also a good one to go ahead and find on Twitter. That is New Orleans. Absolute. And I'm not I'm saying this just because I write for them. I have always been like, oh my God, that's the best lefty rag in the entire world. So that's anti-gravity. So find that. Those are probably my two main things. And then michelleembry.com is my website. And you can find me there for uh, readings that, uh, for card readings and things of that nature. And I put up a tarot card Monday through Friday on all of my social media. Twitter's the best place to find me. Cool. I'll have all of those links in the description. Great. Thank you. Awesome. Thanks, Michelle. Okay. We'll All talk right. soon. Yeah, bye for now.